We've got barbecue back here. You're all invited. Welcome to the Sloopcast. How are you doing today, Kyle? Doing pretty well, Jared. Doing pretty well. How are you doing? I'm not going to complain. Uh, uh, however, I will say uh, it's a new tradition, but it's a good tradition. And there we go. You My got head. some on your, on yeah, your view. I, that was... That was <laughs> Listen, I'm I'm going for energy, not uh, neatness. I don't know what to tell you. Sometimes, <sighs> listen. It sometimes is... you get a little excited. Sometimes you get. No, I'm not going to finish that sentence. I'm not going to yeah, finish that yeah, sentence. Don't. Yeah, I don't. Not going to finish that sentence. Let's let's not. It is June. We are in the thick of wasteland here, Jared. We are in the thick of it. We are indeed in the thick of it. Uh, today, Kyle, we ask the question. What is the modern era of college football? When did it start? You hear people say, well, in the modern era of college football, well, since the modern era of college football, the modern era of you hear just just watch your your preview shows, even when, you know, they'll do stats or you, you hear the phrase the modern era of college football. And I've always asked myself. What what does that mean exactly? What is the modern era of college football? Some of you might be yelling at the screen at your phones right now. Well, it, uh, well, it's when the well, it's when that because here's the thing, because I'm me. I went and I looked. And I didn't ever really find a defined answer to that. I feel like in the NFL, it's basically like when the Super Bowl started, right? No, no one ever talks about how many championships the Browns have because they have no Super Bowls. No one ever talks about how many championships they won before that. Nope. Is it is it when there was... Do you can take in consideration of when there was Ford Pass? Ah, that, when that, that was would... legalized. <laughs> and that that is and I just want to be super clear. And that's that we are going to start with the legalization of the Ford Pass. We are going back that far. But I want to be very clear. I, I'm not trying to come up with the answer to this. I, I, I'm not, I'm, I'm, this is not a, I'm going to die on this hill episode. I'm going to present several cases for when you could possibly call the beginning of the modern era of college football. That's it. I'm going to present many cases. Uh, and I'll let you decide. Uh, even by that standard, is the 90s not the modern era with Nebraska triple option being so dominant? Good questions. Very good questions. Um, but right, well, let's 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 start. let's go and, let's go and let's go and start that off. So in 1906 or 1910, around that around that time is when the legal is late, blah, the the legal legalization the forward pass almost got there yep almost well the forward pass was legalized in 1906 uh i i, I do mark this quote-unquote beginning of modern era these two these two things happened um officially like four years apart but they all sort of had the same root cause um so let's it's 1905 and football has a problem. And that problem mm -hmm. is player safety. Yes. Uh, we, we still have this problem. It's a, it's a violent sport. Um, some things change, some things stay the same. Now I will say it was much worse back then for, for all the people, because I hear people say this all the time. You know, the problem with college football is, or the the problem with football is, is that they have those helmets. If you gave them back the leather helmets, then maybe they wouldn't throw their heads around, yada, yada, yada. Well, in the year 1905, 19 players. And I, and I pulled this, I pulled this from Wikipedia. 
And then I checked the Chicago Tribune because I'm going to I'm going to say this and then you might have which was the source, the Wikipedia source. Because you you might ask the same question that I'm going to ask that, that, that I asked. I couldn't find the answer to it, it said in Wikipedia, 19 players had been killed and 159 seriously injured playing football in the year 1905. 19 deaths. Teddy Roosevelt almost banned the sport too because of it. He actually saved it. Yeah, he saved it. Teddy Roosevelt's actually the one who saved it. Now, 19 players in 1905. I could not find players in college and pros or among all levels. That's that's the answer or that's the question. I, I couldn't. The Chicago Tribune sort that was the source behind the Wikipedia page. I, I didn't find where it specifically said if that was across high school, college. Uh, it just said 19 players had died. So I'm, I'm not. 100% sure what that means or uh, across what levels. Um, uh, the United States President Tony, Teddy Roosevelt, as Odin brought up, uh, saved the sport. There was calls across the country to uh, make it illegal. And I believe it was Teddy Roosevelt who said, I don't have this part in the notes in front of me, but I believe it was Teddy Roosevelt College. who said that it, uh, see, Kyle just finds it. Um, basically said it's too good of a game to simply ban. Instead, we just have to change the rules. Uh, and of course he's the president. And so he demanded that the rules be changed and that the game be reformatted. Um, more than 60 schools got together and committed to make the game safer. This joining of 60 schools. 1905, the Chicago Tribune reportedly published a headline that year titled Football's Death Harvest as 19 college football players had been killed uh, playing the sport with 138 injured. There you go. That's weird. Mine says 159 seriously injured. Mm. Whatever. It, it's still too, still too many. <laughs> so, so I mean, I guess that the, depends down. upon what that means by seriously injured, what specifically that means. But the deaths are the important part, which was 19, which apparently was at just the collegiate level, which is yeah. insane. Um, 60 schools got together. These 60 schools would eventually this meeting starts a series of meetings and a series of committees as the, the bureaucracy uh, uh, of the modern uh, college football uh, goes, still go, goes all the way back to then. But they formed a rules committee. They formed several committees. Out of this meeting, we would eventually get two revolutions in the college football game. We would get a rules committee that would make a few changes to make the game safer. One of those rule changes was the legalization of the forward pass. This rule change went into effect in 1906. And, and I think another part in here too, it was around that time too, is when uh, they started looking at other um, protective equipment mm -hmm. as well too. Yeah. Uh, I believe. Yeah. Um, now, why uh, you get all these schools together, they start forming committees. Why also 1910, you might be asking. Was 1905 sans shoulder pads? I mean, not shoulder pads in the way we think of them, obviously. But I'm not sure. Um. This would also eventually lead to the formation of the NCAA, which officially became a thing in 1910, although its roots go back to 1906 or 1905, rather, with the, you know, 60 schools getting together and deciding that they needed to take collective action and change. So... 
1905, which led to 1906, which led to 1910, was a a transformative era in college football. And therefore, Kyle, I present to you case number one. The modern era of college football started in 1906 in response to a deadly 1905 season. Quite literally deadly. All right. All right. We're off to a, a bloody good start here. Ooh, yeah. Ooh. Kyle, okay. if these people <laughs> wouldn't have already been dead by natural causes, yeah. uh, that would be that would be um, it would be a, a very gross joke. Kyle, I judge you for that except they'd all they'd all already be dead anyway so whatever yeah. all right 1934 is the the next one uh have on here and that is the the ap poll era when the associated press poll um came 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 to tuition here um that was after a three-way tie came between minnesota princeton and southern methodist and then the the following year, the AP College Football Poll was born. Yeah, um, it was uh, again pulling this from Wikipedia because we're scholars here. We pull from Wikipedia. Um, AP Sports editor Alan J. Gould declared a three way champ. As Kyle said, declared a three way championship. Um, this led to. Uh, fans being pissed off. They didn't want a three-way tie. They wanted a champion. And a a man who I believe also worked at the AP, uh, Cy Sherman, suggested that, well, maybe we shouldn't let Allen just choose the national champion. And instead, we should have a bunch of people choose the national championships. Matches everything I've heard about three ways being disappointing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree. Um, so, 1936, uh, 1934, as a result of a three way tie in 1933, led to the adoption of the AP College Football Poll which has run continuously since then. And, and, and I think this could, you could argue that this would be the, you could argue that this would be the modern, the birth of modern era of college that, that, football, that, because that is the argument. Yeah. Because like, it's my second 19, argument of like, like seven. The first with the, um, the legalization of the forward pass, it's still, that's still the, like the infancy still of, of college sure. football because that, that was only a few decades old at at that point and here you you have 30 30 years later when college football is coming around and a lot more popularity and having having a way to figure out who's the true national championship with the AP poll coming around here too so you can you can argue that in my in my opinion I think this could be a um this could be one of i think to me one of three periods of um time of when um you could say that it's m the modern era of college football okay Kyle apparently of my i think i have seven answers um Kyle's going to pick this you're going to say this is one of your strong contenders yes okay so you say a true champion of college football. I will point out that um, the the AP, and neither did the coaches, but we're not even talking about the coaches. The coaches pull sucks. Yeah, yeah. But the AP would basically publish their final poll at the end of the regular season, and then that was it. Those are your na That's your national championship. Yes. Yeah, so For everyone who whines and cries about how the Bulls don't matter anymore. Well, guess what? They, they didn't they even bother did. to rerun the <laughs> poll after the Bulls. For decades. 
Mm-hmm. By the way, the Rose Bowl started, I also believe it was, I think, was it also 1906? Maybe that's another case for the 1906, Kyle. Um, But it, generally in that era is when the Rose Bowl started. So the Rose Bowl's very old. And it wasn't until, Kyle, and this is number, this is answer number three to the question, when did the er- the modern era of college football start? It wasn't until 1965. 1965. There were still schools in the SEC who didn't allow black players on the team in 1965, Kyle. That's not even a joke. That's just true. It wasn't until 1965 that the AP would rerun the poll after the bowl games. So I call this the post-bowl game AP poll era. In 1964, Alabama was named the national champion in the final AP poll uh, because they went undefeated through the regular season. However, uh, they went to the Rose, or excuse me, the Orange Bowl against Texas and lost. Arkansas, who was... Uh, not in the SEC at the time. I was about to say they were in the Big 12 at the time. Then I was like, were they? Because they also might have been in the... You know what? It doesn't matter. Um, Arkansas, however, was now the only undefeated team in the country after they defeated Nebraska in the Cotton Bowl. Yet Alabama, who had lost and not gone undefeated, was still the national champion. And this is not the first time this happened, by the way. This had happened a bunch of times, just so we're clear. Uh, this was just like the last time the AP let this happen. The The coaches poll would let this go on for another decade, by the way. Um, but we don't care about the coaches poll. This was the final straw, however, for the AP poll, because in 1965, the AP decided to not release its final poll until after the bowl games completed. And thank God, because in that season, Michigan State, who was, uh, I guess, ranked number one going into the bowl season. Imagine that Michigan State ranked number one, um, lost to UCLA. Number the number two team in the country, Arkansas, lost to LSU. And fourth ranked and a fourth ranked Alabama defeated Nebraska. I'm not sure what, I'm not sure what happened to the third ranked team. Um it doesn't say. But again, Nebraska I'm pulling this third ranked. Oh, Nebraska. Thank you, Kyle. Um <laughs> Kyle. Always on top of things. Um, Number four, Alabama defeats number three, Nebraska. And since the AP decided to wait that year, Alabama received the national championship. Now, is it bullshit that Alabama got to double dip on this? get a national championship under the old rules one year and then get the national championship under the new rules the next year. Yes, it is. It's a, it's a, it's just stupid coincidence. That's just how the dice rule. But you know, you, sometimes you need a, sometimes you need a little bit of luck. Um, so, uh, in 1965, they decided to wait to do the final poll, but that wasn't officially the rules yet. But in 1960, they, I guess they were just sort of doing it as a case by case basis. Uh, and then in 1968, they decided to make that the permanent rule that they will just always redo a poll after the bowl games have completed. Maybe some baked in racial biases too. who's to say. I mean, again, Alabama, both they, you know, your, your, your alternative was Arkansas. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. Your alternative was Arkansas. So Kyle, 
Answer number three. Before you get to answer 1960. Next- no, no, no. That, that, that was, I'm finishing. Okay. Answer number three, 1965, the post bowl game AP poll era. Now, now do the thing. Before you get to the next one, we'll take a quick ad break then. <laughs> so sit tight. We'll get back to you um, in a moment. And we're back from the ad. Hey, Kyle, you got to at least plug the Patreon. Patreon.thesloopcast.com. Always be plugging. Yes, yes. Also, you can check out uh, the T-shirt store, uh, either merch.thesloopcast.com, or you can see me wearing a 7071 shirt right now, uh, which you can get at 7071.thesloopcast.com. Kyle? This might be... This might be one of my sleeper favorite answers. The uh, the one where the NCAA versus the University of Oklahoma. Yes. Uh, 1984. There is a Supreme Court case that Kyle just mentioned. NCAA versus the Board of Regents of the University of Oklahoma. Where's Esquire when you need him? So this one requires a little bit of history. A lot. It's actually a lot of history. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in 1952, televisions were starting to become a thing. Like. Oh, what just happened? All right. I think I'm fine. I think I'm fine. All right. Minor glitch there for a second. We're good. Um, In 1952, televisions were starting to become a thing. I believe they were in a, you know, about 10% of households. Um, The NCAA decided that in order to protect tick, because some schools are starting to do TV deals, specifically the university of Pennsylvania, not, Pennsylvania state mind you, but the, but you pen started doing local TV deals. Some other schools started doing local TV deals. The NCAA being the giant bureaucratic, uh, control hungry entity that it is decided that in order to protect ticket sales for the stadiums, that they would, take up all the they they decided that all of the tv rights belong to them now and that there would be only one college football game to be televised every saturday one game every saturday a single that in college age. football game would be on television every Saturday. On top of that, no team could appear on television more than once per season. I'd lose my gosh darn mind these days with that. Yeah. One, your team could only be on TV once per year and there was only one game on TV every single week. Now they did over the years start to sort of relax that uh, just a few years later, um, the committee decided to start doing some regional games. So out of eight eight weeks out of the year, they do one big national game uh, and then for another five weeks out of the year, they would not do one big national game, but different regions would get different games. So it did allow more teams to get on TV, but not in front of a national audience. But there was still only one game. I mean, as a consumer, you still only got one game a week. It's it's just that sometimes out of those weeks, they would be a regional game and not a national game. But you as a consumer were still just getting one game a week. And it went on like this 
for a while. This is one of the reasons, by the way, that bowls were such a big deal because the bowls had their own TV deals. They would legitimately be maybe the one time you got to see a team play the entire season was was a bowl game. This is partially why bowls were such a this is why your great grandparents and your grandparents care so much about bowl games. That's that's it. Don't. Duly noted. <laughs> in 1977, a bunch of universities, because they, I guess they didn't feel like the NCAA was properly representing them anymore. Because remember, it was a bunch of universities that got together that formed the NCAA to begin with. Well, in 1977, a bunch of universities got together and formed the College Football Association. A bunch of <laughs> essentially. Uh, college football universities decided they were going to unionize. Uh, this group of colleges started the dominoes that would eventually lead to the NCAA versus the Board of Regents of the Oklahoma, excuse me, of the University of Oklahoma, uh, the Supreme Court case. Um That's it. Like 1984, starting in 1984, which, by the way, was about the same time that cable TV was starting to become popular. That this is when, you know, it's it's hard to define exactly what this era is. I simply call it the TV rights era, but this is what started the also like started the big money era of college football. You now had conferences that were able to take the TV rights. And this is when college football started to become lucrative. And this is also the time, Jared, when the, when division one really split from the 1A and the 1AA too. It was, it was a little bit before 84. It was like in the mid-late 70s. Um, they had the split that will eventually become the FBS and the FCS then. Right. So a lot, lot, lot of things happen around this time. You also have like one of the first big... I mean, this is also like... <sighs> you start to see the big wave of realignments come after this too, because yeah. now there's a lot of money involved. You had a lot of teams, a lot of universities that weren't a part of conferences, Penn state, Florida state, Miami, a bunch of others started to join conferences because they wanted to be in on this collective bargaining TV rights deals. 1984, I, again, I call it like the TV rights era, but this is when college football started to become a big money sport. So, Kyle, this, I say to you, 1984, the start of the TV, the TV revolution of college football, this is when the modern era of college football started. No, another good candidate, I... It's hard to argue against against that. It's yeah, just a, a lot of a lot of things, a lot of things that happened around that time, and yeah, it, it's a it's a very good candidate to to be the the start of the modern era of college football. But I would say, Jared, if I want to move just a little bit further ahead from that, move ahead about eight years or so. When you get when you got the beginning of the uh, the bowl coalition, the beginning of the first FBS conference championship games, yeah, and that and and also to our standard in today in two thousand twenty four of the eighty five scholarship limit for college football um, universities as well. Spike says, living in Florida in the eighties and nineties, anytime Ohio State was playing at three thirty, it fell under ABC's quote, regional coverage rules 
which uh, was mostly ACC games, had to watch the scrolling ticker to see score updates. And that was even going on a new fucking awful. Um, yeah, it's. It was still bad. I mean, it's still we, we, we really live in the golden era of access now. Um, now, if you were living in Ohio, you could still basically see every single college football game or Ohio State game, rather. Now, you can see any game you want to see. It's on somewhere. Uh, if you lived out, it, it's, I mean, you say, oh, Spikes, how did you do, you know, Gangland responds, I don't know how you do it. Well, I got news for you. This is still how it is with the NFL. Unless you have, you know, the, you know, Sunday ticket package or, you know, an illegal stream. Not, not that I would, uh, you know, ever promote such a thing. Um, you still can't watch your teams out of market. You still can't watch your teams out of market. This, we, we still don't have this level of access in the NFL unless you happen to choose the exact right TV provider and then pay out the nose for it. Anyway, <laughs> I do that. There you go, Spikes. Okay, Kyle. 1998. Sorry, we got, I know you already started this, but we got sort of caught off on a, a, a chat-based tangent. 1998, the BCS slash internet era. Mm -hmm. As Kyle said, the sort of started in 1992. It didn't, it didn't really get off the ground until 1998, but it started in 1992. You know, you had what was called the Bull Coalition. The Bull Coalition was the predecessor to the BCS. It's, it's um, I think it was kind of part of it. I think the, in 1995, the you get the Bull Alliance. Like in 92, which is when... Penn State Which joined the Big Kyle, Ten. Was this a is, was this um, a then renaming you, you, of the Bull Coalition or was this the yeah, Bull Coalition? It does. I yeah. forget. And but in 90, 95 was when the SWC collapsed, and that's when you had the the Big Twelve, and then you had which all of this States, goes back to eighty four uh, with around that money. time. It's it's just the money the, uh, game. The ACC then as well. A lot of a lot of the blue 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 collar or, or red collar or the um red 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 blood thank you uh teams that we that we know today moved moved in the 90s turmoil mm -hmm. blood yeah Yeah, it was one of the first like big conference realignment shifts. Um, they, obviously, conference realignment was has been a thing since conferences have been a thing. But as far as like massive shifts, like the 92 ish was one of the, these first like enormous shifts. Um this is when you got your first conference championship games. This is when, you know, as you know, the bowl coalition and the bowl Alliance were things um, you saw, you saw a desire for a playoff. This is what people were, were like, I maybe people have been crying, yelling for a playoff forever. I don't know. But like, you know, you start to talk about the early 90s, mid 90s. This is sort of where my own personal football, you know, fanship starts. As you know, 
a, a, a youngin in that time. And I st- distinctly remember even back then people were yelling about a playoff. They wanted a playoff. Why doesn't college football have a playoff? The FCS has, of course, we didn't call it the FCS back then. We called it 1AA. 1AA has a playoff. The NFL has a playoff. Division 2 and Division 3 have playoffs. Why doesn't big boy college football have playoffs? And out of this is, you know, where the Bowl Coalition and the Bowl Alliance start to start to come together. Now, the problem with the Bowl Alliance, however, was that the Bowl Alliance was an alliance between the Sugar Bowl, the Orange Bowl, and the Fiesta Bowl. Uh, for those of you keeping count at home, very noticeably missing the Rose Bowl. It's kind of a big deal. The, the idea of the Bowl Alliance yeah, was to get rarely, number one and number two to actually ever, play each other. Happened. Which you, you, you kind of get close sometimes. You get like for any of the four. youngins in the audience wasn't the thing you got very often. All right. Kyle, hold on. I got numbers. I got numbers. Eh, uh, so we we did we weren't getting like actual national championships, and this lack of clarity led to multiple national championships being claimed every year, which is a thing we've talked about a lot on this podcast, including a lot of sketchy national title claims. Kyle, from the year nineteen hundred, and I chose that just to make it a nice round number, ninety eight. To the year 1997, which was the last year before the BCS. From the year 1900 to the year 1997, <laughs> for those of you bad, I know math not very quick at math, that is here, 97 but... years. <laughs> Technically true. 98 years. <laughs> you know, Kyle... Yes. Thank you, Gangland. Exactly that. So it was a custom. Um, yeah. In 98 years. It was about 2.2. There were 218 claimed national <laughs> titles. Now, Kyle, you're the one that's good at quick math. So how he, many he how he many he champions <laughs> is that per year? So, so, so like it, it was, was custom. On that. It was custom. I'm just going to let you have it for those 98 years to have two. Because that's what that's what friends do. Champions. They don't call each other out on very Every, minor. No, on average, math on mistakes average, on a podcast. You, you were having you were having two national champions every year. Or more. I I know. At least, Kyle, I found instances of four. You don't get the 2.2, which I'm just, again, trusting is the answer, without going over two pretty frequently. Because there were years where there was only one. You had to have some years in there really driving that average up. There were multiple occurrences of three and four claimed national titles a year. That is not a way to run a sport. And people were understandably pissed off and frustrated by this. I mean, it's almost as irritating as another ad break in the middle of this case. Which is what I'm doing right now. If you want to avoid these ad breaks... Uh, you can go to patreon.thesloopcast.com. You can get access to a version of the show that has no ads in it. Uh, that again, patreon.thesloopcast.com. Uh, here's those ad breaks now. Kyle, I'm not going to go through the entire list here. 
But even after, so in just the, hold on. I had, I had this shortened version of this. I don't think I forgot. I think I forgot to put it in the notes. Um, in the 10 years before the national title, um, Yeah, the 10 years before the national title, there were instances of number one and number two actually playing each other. Happened only three times. From 1988 to 1997, only three times did number one and number two play each other. Even with the Bowl Alliance and the Bowl Coalition, the pre-BCS attempts to fix this, without the Big Ten playing along, without the Pac-12 playing along, it didn't mean anything. Example, in 97, number one Michigan played number eight Washington State. Which is why Michigan split that title. Because you couldn't get number, you couldn't get Nebraska, who was in the Big 12 at the time, and Michigan to play each other because the Rose Bowl wasn't playing along with the Bowl Alliance. You had the same thing happen um, in 96 because number two Arizona State was busy getting their faces clocked in by number four Ohio State because Arizona State was in the Pac 12 at the time. Although I think it was actually the Pac-10 at the time. And therefore wouldn't go and play number one Florida State. You would very rarely get number one and number two to play each other. And that's just not a way to run the sport. Therefore, in 1998, they tried it again. That's that is correct. That is David Boston. Sean Springs also had an amazing game that game. Um, in 1998, they tried it again. That is Joe Germain. Joe Germain is my personal goat. Um, in 1998, they tried it again. And this is when the BCS was born. The night, the big difference between the BCS and the previous attempts to do this is that finally the Big Ten and the Pac-10 decided to play along. And from this point forward, number one and number two were guaranteed to play each other for the national championship. And without this, Ohio State does not win the national championship in 2002. They would have gone to play. They had gone to play in the Rose Bowl. Miami would have played someone else. And if Miami won that game against someone else, Miami would have been the national champions. And Ohio State would not have gotten a chance to prove it on the field. It's actually crazy how these things would often line up or rather not line up. Um, I mean, in 1991, speaking of Miami, Miami won the national championship game against number 11, Nebraska. Meanwhile, Washington, who was number two at the time and Michigan number four at the time, Washington beat number four, Michigan in the Rose bowl. And by the way, beat them by a lot, 34 to 14, but Washington did not win the yep. national title because Miami defeated number 11, Nebraska. Miami did not, excuse me. Washington did not get a fair chance to win the national championship game that year or to win the national championship because there was no national championship game that year. So Kyle, I, I offer you the beginning. Oh, actually before I, before I do that, another very important factor 
happening around the year of 1998. The rise of things like the rise of the Internet, essentially, the not the Internet. The Internet had been around for decades, but rather the World Wide Web, the browsable Internet. I'm an IT nerd. I have to distinguish that there is a difference between the World Wide Web, the browsable Internet and, oh, and the yes. Internet. I, I have to do that. It's it's my job. Um, but uh, the World Wide Web, I did not, which led to things like team blogs who didn't spend some time on the ozone forum and the ozone forum just shut down Kyle. I don't know if you saw that set. No, it's, it's, it's sad. Um, you had the ozone forum and you had team blogs and you had message boards and you had, you know, eventually social media and podcast and YouTube. Um, and also, you know, just a couple years later, you started getting internet recruiting databases. Cause when someone says to you, Kyle, you know, this is the highest rooted, highest recruited player that such and such at such and such position for such and such schools ever, ever of all time, ever of all time. They're just talking about since the year 2000. Because there were no recruiting databases before approximately the year 2000. So this is another thing that was happening alongside. <laughs> that's insane. <laughs> One of the younger members of the uh, Discord community is getting his head exploded right now. Um, yeah, it, but before this era, you basically had ABC... And that was it. Yeah, and your local newspaper. That that's that's the coverage you got for college football, was ABC, NBC, and you know ESPN, which was ABC. Um, actually, when did that start? I don't care. We're not we're not getting on that sidetrack. Um, <laughs> we lived in the Stone Age pre two thousand. We did. Um, That's it. Like you had your local newspaper and you had uh, a couple hours of TV coverage every week. That that was that was yeah, your access to college football. <laughs> Kyle, I present to you. The modern era of college football, 1998. I heard Jim Tressel say they used yeah. to print it's, out film on ago. paper, frame by frame to game plan. And I can't imagine doing that, dude. It's only been a few years ago that this is how they sent footage to players on the NFL sidelines. It wasn't until the Microsoft surface. If you remember the Microsoft surface there, the uh, Microsoft came out as a competitor for the iPad that Microsoft came and said, here, take these tablets, put the films, put the images on the tablets. It, but it wasn't until then. It wasn't before that they were still sending stills printed to the NFL sidelines. Wild. Yeah. Quarterbacks flipping sheets on the sidelines after every drive. Oh yeah. You saw they cut back to the quarterback and he's flipping through black yeah, and white. I kind, of, I kind of, I kind of crazy that that has, that changes. So recent slash BCS together. Kyle, 1998 modern era of college football. So, so, so that's, that's like my second, that's like my, it, how do you my, feel about that? How do you feel about the that? Different eras of college football. That's that's where the second in my mind, where the second era happens. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's it's all one big. You could. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's I I, fish, I I wanted to pick a year, so I picked understand 1998 because that's the first BCS year. But no, you're right. It started before that. Um, 
it's 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 a you know the mid 90s but i i wanted to i wanted each of these to be a specific year but you were correct you are correct we're we're going to run into that with the last selection which is not this selection this is the second to last selection i'm not going to spend any time on this um I, I I would imagine, oh God, Kyle, I just doubted this before I said it. Anyone listening or watching this, I don't have to explain to them what the beginning of the playoff era meant. It, yeah, it's only been 10 years. It's been 10 years, Kyle. We've had a playoff for 10 years. But yeah, we we went... From 1998 to 2014, the fact that it took this long still pisses me off. In 1998, we started, we finally started to get a guarantee that number one and number two would play each other. We all thought, okay, here it is. This, this is the thing that gets us to the playoffs. It, it still took, it still took Kyle. Another 16 years. But in 2014, we finally got a four team playoff. Mm -hmm. Hearing we've had a playoff for 10 years makes me feel old. <sighs> Gangland, me having to explain to you what was what it was like before the BCS makes me feel old. <laughs> Having to explain to you what it was like before the internet <laughs> and team Surprise. blogs. <laughs> I remember a time before 11 Warriors totally existed. Surprised because you've mentioned it how many times already. <laughs> this is why I, I don't like the movie Rudy. I'm sorry. This is a small tangent. I don't like the movie Rudy. But. I don't like the movie Rudy. However, there is a beautiful scene in the movie Rudy. It's a beautiful scene. And I don't like the movie, so you know I'm being sincere. Where Rudy's dad, who always watched Notre Dame on TV. By the way, this is why Notre Dame is such a big deal. They weren't tied into the pre-1984 TV rules somehow. I forget exactly how that works. One of the reasons why Notre Dame was such a big deal is because they were on TV more than everyone else. Details we don't need to get into. Anyway, he always watched TV. He always watched Notre Dame on this little tiny shitty television. Because that's what existed back then. Hyper low def black and white television. Because that's just what existed. And there is a scene towards the end of the movie where his dad finally went to go see with an antenna on the TV. Exactly. Finally went to go see a Notre Dame game live. And he is awestruck by what it is to see the game in the stadium in real life. It's a beautiful scene that is uh, lost. I was, I will say might be totally lost in your younger generations who don't know what it's like to have watched. I mean, I, 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 I'm not of like the black and white TV era, but I'm definitely of the standard deaf TV era. The MTV era. Sure. Yeah. Anyway, the playoff era. It's a beautiful scene that I think might be lost on younger users because or younger viewers because they don't know what it was like to watch shitty broadcast of football. Anyway. Um, no. 2021, Kyle. Now, I will argue that the the playoff air, most people this, are not going to call either is, 2014 or 2021 era. quote this is, the modern mind, era of college football. Big change in the new era of college football. Now, they aren't going to do it now. However, when you and I are old, older, mm 
my my argument here, I, I mentioned the NFL, right, with the Browns and how no one gives the Browns credit for their pre Super Bowl champions. Fast forward twenty, they, they still, thirty they years still from will. now, and, and, unless and there's a change, even acknowledge like, you, you brought up the NFL, the NFL college says, football championships oh, the, that happened before the, the, U- the, the year two thousand fourteen, five Super Bowls, not 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 five championships, but it's five Super Bowls. Now, if there was something about college football coming up with a name for a national title, that's completely different than the past over a hundred years, then maybe. But if we're, if they're going to still say here national champions, they're they're still gonna they're still gonna look at years past. I don't know. I'm so I'm just saying I'm including the year 2004. I would love to get into this conversation, Kyle, but we're running long. 2014 and 2021 are not years that anyone living and breathing right now would actually call the modern era of college football. I just want to say I acknowledge that. However, if I'm forecasting 20, 30 years into the future, those people might refer to the modern era of college football as starting in 2014, maybe even 2021. 2021 is my final case that I am making for the modern era of college football. Now, much like Kyle, you know, Kyle was saying about the BCS slash internet era, I, I picked a year but there were things that happened before this that that also need to be acknowledged. Um, I call this the player rights slash expanded playoff era. We know that starting in the year 2024, we are getting expanded playoffs. It is no longer four teams. Yeah, 26. This year, it'll be 12 teams. And then starting, I believe, next year or 2026, I forget, it expands to 14 teams. Um, but something bigger, I think, happened in 2021. I'm still rolling this all into sort of one seismic shift. In 2021, that is the year that two rules were adopted that marked a important era for the players specifically. In 2021, we got the one-time transfer rule allowing any player the ability to transfer without penalty once in their career giving players an unprecedented amount of mobility and ownership over their own careers. Additionally, in 2021, the NCAA was forced, let's be honest, forced to adopt NIL. Players officially started getting paid. And I'll say in 2018, because again, this started before this, we got the transfer portal, which allowed a player to transfer without getting permission from their existing coach. A coach couldn't block a Michigan player from, from going to Ohio State or an Ohio State player from going to Michigan. In 2019, players got the right to transfer free of penalty if their coach left if their coach got a better got a better deal or a better situation the players also got to get that in 2024 which again is the the year we are currently living and breathing the NCAA took the one time transfer the one time transfer rule and said all time transfer rule unlimited transfers 
we have free agency in college football now. And I get that a lot of people out there don't like that. I get that. But it does give players. You can decide if this is a good thing or a bad thing for yourself. But it allows players to take ownership of their own careers. For better or for worse, the decision is now in the hands of the players and not the coaches. Additionally, and this is very, very recent, the NCAA reached a settlement with the major conferences of college football to allow schools to start directly paying players. You could say that this era is starting in 2024. We have direct payment to players. We have the expanded playoff. So I don't know, 21 slash 24, whatever. We're in a new era of college football right now, starting in the year 2024. Although, like I said, you could date this back to 2018 with the, with the foundating or the foundating, the foundating is not, is not a, is not a word. The foundation of the transfer portal. We are in a brand new era of college football. Yep. Again, this started in 2018, but it's really taking off in 2001. And then again, in 2024, Kyle, the new era of college football, we're in its infancy. And we don't know where it's going. Spike says when the Big Ten and SEC break off and create their own semi-professional league, it will invalidate pretty much all the other eras. (sighs) Maybe. I mean, I guess it depends on what you mean by invalidate. Um, But yeah, I mean, (laughs) it's heading there. No longer modern. If you were to so pick it's just, one, it's Jared, the postmodern. What would it be? You, y- y'all, y'all want to have a conversation about postmodern and metamodern? Oh darn! Look at that. We're over on time. We can't start that conversation now. <sighs> Me as a person living here in the year twenty twenty four, I think my answer is 1984 because i think to me that's when it became yeah, to, a to money me, sport. to me i, I think it's you the, can look at every conference realignment to me it's the every one bcs for a playoff is the mo- all is of that era is driven by just, money and the money entered the sport well in 1984 it's what we're accustomed to the 85 scholarship limit as well too and then seeing Pretty much all. Okay, the, I, that's a fair answer. Uh, all the major conferences, minus the Pac-10 now, <laughs> that we're that we're all uh, accustomed to to um, seeing in today's age. Yeah, yeah. It would be the playoffs. I, I still yeah. think, however, in 20 or 30 years, as I said, I think people will look to the modern era of college football, their version of the modern era of college football starting right here. No. Oh, no, I know. I know. Right here, right now. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Not 2014. <laughs> right here, right now. We're, we're in the... We're in the start of, I mean, look with NIL and everything. I mean, you could make an argument and mathematically, this argument is totally sound that the original playoff, the 14 playoff is a lot closer to the BCS from, from two to four. than the playoff is to the new playoff from four to 12 or 14, if we just want to fast forward a year. Um, It's mathematically true. 
you know, it's, I, I don't know. It's, I think we're in what the future will call the beginning of the modern era of college football. But me sitting here right now, to me, it's 1984. Because, you know, money and sex, they change everything. 1984 was when college football, that was the, that was the opening of the floodgate that led to the money that led to all of the other changes that we're talking about now, because without that injection of money, you, you don't get college game day. You don't get all the conference realignments with, you know, that you got in the early nineties. You don't get any of the conference, the major conference realignments that have happened since you don't get a playoff. We're still just recycling the old bowl system. If not for the money. Mm -hmm. And the, the money floodgates opened in 1984 and it just took, you know, 40 years for that money to eventually trickle down to the players. When, cause that's all. If you, if you look at players starting to get money, people say, Oh, it's ruining college football. If you think money ruins college football, then you have to go back to 1984. All this is that we're living in right now is the players are finally getting their fair share of the money that started coming in in 1984. That's it. Anyway, Kyle, um, I think we had a couple submissions from other people, what they thought their theirs were. We're already kind of super over on time, though. Um Austin says, I feel like you can weirdly do it from the time Urban Meyer retires at OSU. Fields come in day. Um, not to mention, I think Urban going to Florida kind of started that middle era of college football too. started the run of the SEC national title wins into sort of like the pre-modern era. Urban to Urban kind of tells the story of college football. Well, Austin, I think, is working in a more limited scope than what we did. Um, I literally went 120 years into the past. Um, let's say, oh, the NCAA question from, from Odin. Um, trying to get it on screen. Uh, let's say everyone has a new console and the new NCAA game in July. What's the first game you load up in the play now menu yep, that yep. doesn't involve Ohio state. I'm picking Utah and BYU. I'm going straight to the dynasty mode. Yep. So the first game I play is the first game on the Ohio state schedule. Straight up. I'm, I don't go into play now. I'm going straight into dynasty mode. Although I don't, I'm going to wait to see how everyone likes the game first. Yeah. Um, I think the modern era could be 2014, a case we made. This is Odin again saying this. I understand some saying 2000 plus, which is essentially what we said with 98, right? Um, I think the modern era started when schools started targeting out of state recruits, though. That's an interesting because there's the thing, we're not going to find like a specific year for this, but when did college football stop just recruiting players who are already on campus and start inviting high schoolers to come play football in order to play football at your at your college? And when did that eventually evolve into national recruiting? I won't I won't say out of state because. Uh, you know, if they're like a regional, you know, if they were in Pennsylvania or Michigan or Indiana or whatever. But when when was the first time Ohio State went to California to get a kid or to Texas to get a kid is a, is a good question. Um, 
that the, I, I don't know how to quantify that. But I think it's a very just I, I think it's a good answer. You know, when did you know, if we if we if we count the Internet era is like modern recruiting. Or as maybe postmodern recruiting, when did modern recruiting start? When did you actually start in offering scholarships to come play football here? And when did recruiting become a national thing? I think I don't have answers for either of those, but I think that those are very interesting places to start to start the modern era of college football. I don't know exactly what years those would be. It would be different for every school, obviously. Not it, It's not like everyone just started doing that all mm. at once. So you're not going to get like a very specific year. But I think those are very, as as loose concepts, uh, I think those are both very just interesting real quick, answers. Just he's, a, he's an all-time book guy favorite of mine. We, we, we have I like those a, answers. Um, we have a all um, right, Kyle. We're a gift. Super if you search for like Do you have anything in and all that? We we have one, maybe maybe more than one actually, of uh, of Braxton Miller. Braxton Miller. Braxton Miller inducted to the Ohio State Athletic Hall of Fame. Sure, sure. Yes, yes, I did see that. Um, he's in at least two, although one of them, he's just, yeah, that, that's one of them. He's also in another one where a absolute pancake block is being leveled. Um, oh, he's not really the star of that one, but he is technically in it. Um He's the only confirmed for this year. Yeah, this is the one. That's uh, Mike Hall, I believe. Landing that absolute monster block on the comeback here. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think if he's in another one. But anyway, um, but yeah, those are our boom gifts, by the way. If you use uh, any of like the keyboard gif things if you search sloopcast there are many sloopcast gifs so if not his touchdown pass against wisconsin should be i I don't i know which one you're talking about i don't know if that makes like a good boom gif which is what most of them (laughs) that i made are yeah all right all right um it's sort of like his touchdown against penn state um, which is one of my all-time favorite Braxton Miller plays. It just doesn't necessarily make like a good like boom gif. Well, that's that's Coach Slagle right there. All right, that's the end of the episode. End of the episode. End of the episode. We're ending the episode now. We're way over. Tonight's ending music will be brought to you by uh, Saving Escape. Uh, they are a uh, they are a band from Cincinnati. I, I'll just say that. Give them a listen. Um, so with all that being said, I'd like to encourage everyone to drink local beer, listen to local music, and of course, support your local podcasters. Once again, this is Saving Escape.